Well, good morning, church. He is risen. And, amen. Would you stand and sing along with us? Good morning. Good morning. Let me first of all 
Testament. There ain't no script, but you know, I don't stick to it anyway. So we're going to go like this. Baptism first. First of all, welcome. Resurrection Sunday. Easter Sunday. I know churches are more packed than usual. People get a little bit extra fancy. But please not forget what it's really about and what he did. God gave his only begotten son, shed his blood for our sins. And even though on that Friday, they thought it was over. But on Sunday, he rose. He rose for us. So death was defeated. So as I say again, happy Resurrection Sunday. For you at home, even in here, just text us. Just say hello. 336-777-7990. Come see us. He's just not here for this one Sunday. He's here every day. He's here every Sunday. So let's just make it just not, not just, just about the day. Make it every day and give an understanding of what our Lord and Savior is for. So, hmm? Oh, you waiting on the pastor? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, Dr. There he is. Okay. There he is. Yes. Oh, you're good. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, brother. Oh, you're more than welcome. <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you. We have the privilege today of providing the sacrament of children's baptism. To Callie Mae Hobson. I'm going to ask the family to come forward now and family back there, family up here. Hi. Oh, I'm fine. They thought I wasn't going to make it. I was, I was at the uh, 8 o'clock service and we end in the cemetery. But on Easter, it never ends in the cemetery. So here I am. Uh, and we are so honored. What a, what a great day to do a, a, a service of baptism. I need to ask the family uh, and the church some questions. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and are given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift to us, offered without price. I present to you for baptism this morning, Callie Mae Hobson. To the parents. <laughs> Good. Let them see you're so pretty. They were looking at me, which is no fun. Let them look at you. Or your granddaddy. Yeah. Yeah. We ask the parents on behalf of of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and injustice in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your faith teaching example, she, both of them, may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? And now to the church, the answer is we will, we hope. Will you support this child, these children, this family with love and prayers and live before them a life of faith that serves as a model for Christian discipleship? Amen. What full name is given this child? Callie, this water, I'm going to put some on your forehead, not a whole lot. Uh, not a whole lot. You're safe. Uh, this water comes from the River Jordan, the same place where Jesus was baptized. Isn't that neat? So, 
Want to touch? Yeah. See? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A little chilly, don't they? Yeah. Ah, yeah, it's a little cold. Wouldn't want to shower in it. No. All right, Callie Mae Hobson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, world without end, amen. You are baptized. You are baptized. Here is a certificate that someday you'll look back on and think how special, and here's your own beginner's Bible. And there's a, a letter in there just celebrating uh, what we've done this morning. You want to hold this? You want mommy or daddy? You want to hold it? All right. Cool. We're so proud of you and of you, and thank you for bringing us this moment on Easter. Thank you very much. Marcy was to have been with us for this. She ordinarily presents the Bible, but... Uh, this is a big day in the Children's Center. She had group after group after group and could not be here, but she also sends her prayers and blessings to the family. Would you stand and sing with us? It's a glorious day, you know?
you to think for a minute. You to think they thought it was over. I mean, they were, they thought it was over. Mary went to the tomb that morning, and it wasn't over. He wasn't there, was he? He was not there. And thank God he wasn't, because that's what he did for us. He took all of that so that we could be with him forever and ever in heaven.
So I got a, I got a little secret for you. Somebody up here, probably wearing a white guitar, started that song in the wrong key. And she carried it. She hadn't practiced it in that key. So, Isla, you're a trooper, girl. Good morning. My name is Vanessa Irby, and welcome on this Resurrection Sunday. We here at Mount Tabor believe in the power of prayer, and we want to be in prayer for you. We are to carry one another as Christ's followers. If you're watching online, you can leave a comment. You can email the church. Here at the Ospal Worship Center, we have a prayer board. I'm sure anybody would love to pray with you. In just a moment, I'll pray, and the ushers will step forward and collect the offering. If you're not prepared to give today, that's no problem. You can always give online. You can mail your payment, whatever works for you. Um, we're just so glad that you're here, and your presence is just such a blessing. I hope that you guys have been doing this study. This study has really blessed me. I was really amazed because you think, how many times have I read the gospel? It's going to be the same old spiel. And it really hasn't been. It's been enlightening. And if you haven't gotten a chance to pick it up and do it, I would recommend it. Uh, part of the reading this week comes from Mark 14, 26, um, that we read in our study. And it says, and when they had sung a hymn, talking about the disciples, they went to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Peter, the, of um, the transfiguration, the one that offered to, send to set up a tent for him when they saw um, the mountaintop, what they saw on the mountaintop, he was so overzealous, and I love Peter because I feel like I can relate to them. Peter said, even if they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you this very night, before the crow crows, before the rooster crows three times, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Of course, we all know how that story goes. He does inevitably deny him. That was the crucifixion, but then Sunday came. And on Sunday, we know the women were on their way to the tomb to anoint Jesus with spices. And in Mark 16, it says, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen, he's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Jesus loved Peter. Um, Jesus, even though Peter denied him, left him, Peter, Jesus never gave up on Peter, and that's what Sunday is about. We know that later on, Pentecost happened, and tongues of fire came down from heaven, and the Holy Spirit was introduced in the world. But what I find really interesting is if we look back in history, Nero, the emperor Nero, persecuted the Christian church, and we know that Peter actually did end up making good on his promise. If, you, if I have to die for you, I will. And he was crucified. But he didn't consider himself worthy to be crucified in the manner that Jesus was. He requested to be crucified upside down. And to me, that redemption story gives me chills. I don't know if any of the rest of you need redemption, but I certainly do. There are situations in my life. And even if you're not called to martyrdom, we are, are called to die to ourselves daily. We cannot do that without Jesus. And that's what Easter is about because he came back and gave us the Holy Spirit. We're able to leave through him and do things beyond ourselves. I pray today that if you haven't surrendered your will to him, that God would help you do so. Because nothing is better than him. Just like that song says, he'll turn your grave into a garden. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that the pain of Friday came, but then so did the joy of Sunday. And that no matter what, you are with us. And that you can redeem our story, just like you redeemed Peter's. Lord God, even in the little things, you care about the sparrow. You care about the lilies of the field. God, nothing is better than you. Nothing's too big for us. Let us rely on you. Let us seize, surrender our will to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside then at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul by the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious
going to read a scripture passage from the 28th chapter of Matthew, and then I'm going to add one other verse uh, from John chapter 12. Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Lo, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And from the 12th chapter of John, just one verse, 32nd verse, Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all others unto myself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Oh God, may this, your word of resurrection and victory, become our source of hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been preaching on Easter Sundays. I was counting up yesterday, and I think this is the 45th or the 46th Easter when I preached. I started when I was three. <laughs> uh, and I'll share with you a secret. I didn't always tell everybody every place, but there's never been one of those Easter Sunday sermons when I didn't entertain at least the fantasy or the temptation to read the gospel story, shut the Bible, sing the closing hymn, pronounce the benediction, and go home. Because in truth, what can any preacher say that matches the power and the majesty and the eloquence of the lesson itself? Now it's never stopped us from trying, and since I went on preaching all those years, why start something different now? But we always know we can't match what the gospel story says. It's kind of like uh, trying to explain to someone Handel's Messiah or the Brandenburg Concerto. No matter what words you use, they pale in comparison to the beauty of the music. But what we preachers do on Easter is to take the matchless story and try as best we can to apply it to our own stories because this is what Jesus said is supposed to happen. And I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all others unto myself. In other words, his resurrection story becomes ours too. So with that in mind, I want to mention just two things today from his story that impact ours. The first is this. The resurrection provides faith in the face of fear. And there's a lot of fear going around nowadays. All of us seem to be afraid of something. Some folks seem to be afraid of pretty much everything. There is, in fact, a phobia about that, did you know? Panophobia, the fear of everything. And there are all kinds of them. Uh, when you begin looking around, there, there's... Uh, uh, ecclesiophobia. Ecclesiophobia is the fear of church. According to national statistics, between now and next Sunday, half of the people who come to church on Easter will develop that. 
and they won't get over it till Christmas. Um, Cetophobia. You ever heard of that one? Of all the pains and problems and struggles I have in my life, this is at least one I have never experienced. It's the fear of food. Uh, Neophobia. The fear of anything new. I've not experienced that, thank God, here in this church, but all of us at least know of a church here or there we've been connected with usually uh, that have that, operate from that mindset. If it's anything new, we're afraid of it, not going to try it, not going to go there. Politicophobia, fear of politicians. I got that one. <laughs> There's even something called phobophobia, the fear of phobias. We are of people who are afraid. A lot of fear going around always has been, I suppose, certainly in the Bible, certainly even in the resurrection accounts, even with an empty tomb, there are all these references to fear. The angel said to the women, do not be so afraid. And the guards for fear trembled and became like dead men, and the disciples hid behind locked doors for fear of their persecutors. And the women left the garden with fear and great joy. And Jesus greeted them, saying, Be not afraid, it is I. What they learned was that life for them and for us brings fear. But resurrection for them and for us, brings faith greater than anything we've been afraid of. About 10 years ago, I was invited to be part of a panel of judges for a public speaking contest. It was at the 92nd Street Y. There were six of us who were judges, uh, primarily because we were free. And... uh, there were these people who had been through this long process of making speeches, and then some were eliminated, kind of like, I don't know, the, the NCAA tournament. If you were eliminated, if you were eliminated, if you were eliminated. And, and they finally got into the last 10. And each of them was going to make a 10-minute speech, and then they would be uh, critiqued by those of us on the panel, hopefully in a kind way, a helpful way, because they wanted to be speakers And um, then one of them would go home with the trophy, the award, the Speaker of the City for that year. It was a big deal for them, and I took it seriously. Uh, There was a woman who spoke that night, a young woman whose last name was Height, H-I-T-E. And to me, hands down, she was the winner. The other judges did not see it that way. She didn't take home the trophy, but I thought she should have, uh, just for her topic alone, This young woman, H-I-T-E, height, her topic was how she conquered her fear of heights. Why the other judges didn't see the humor in that, I do not know. I thought, man, it was worth coming up here just to hear her announce her topic. Give her a prize. Let's go home. But I remember what she said. Uh, She was deathly afraid of heights. Uh, Going up an escalator scared her to death. And she decided uh, that finally, after all these years, I can't allow myself to be governed by fear. I've just got to face it head on. And so she did that by taking trapeze lessons. She went to this person who had helped train folks for Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and he taught trapeze lessons to folks. And she went, and she was terrified, had to have two people behind her and a connected belt to go up the ladder to the platform. But when she got to the platform, had to take off the belt because on the trapeze, you know, you've got to be able to swing out there. So she said she stood on the platform with her eyes shut and the, the man on the other platform, the teacher said, now I'm going to say one, two, three, go, and you jump. And then when I say let go, you let go and I'll catch you. And don't worry, there's a net down there. There's nothing that can happen. She said, but it was high. So I'm standing, my eyes closed. I couldn't bear to look. And I heard one, two, three, jump. And sure enough, she said, he jumped. Not me. No, no, no. It's way high up here. So he swung back. He said, all right, that that happens sometimes. All right, this time we're ready now. One, two, three, jump. He jumped. Nothing, nothing. It took a while. 
Finally, finally she did it. She jumped, and then he said, let go. And she thought, there is no way on God's green earth that I'm doing that. So she swung back to the platform, did that three or four times. He finally came over to her platform, and he said, uh, do you trust me? And I don't just mean as a teacher. I mean as a trapeze artist. I have been doing this my entire life. Do you trust me? She said, yeah. He said, good, because that all of it hinges on that. You, you've got to trust me. You've got to know that when you let go, I will catch you. And I will not let you fall. Well, he did it a couple more times, and finally she said, sure enough, he said, let go, and for some reason, I let go. And I remember feeling his hands wrap around my wrist, and sure enough, he caught me, and he held me. I did not fall. They lowered us gently and slowly to the net. She said after that, she went to uh, just around the corner to a hamburger place, and she said, I sat there and I processed what I had just been through. She said, I remember thinking, I, I've learned two things tonight. The first thing is that never again in my life will I go to a trapeze class. <laughs> but the second thing, she said, I learned this whole evening has been a metaphor. This entire experience, because there are things in my life I have been holding on to, and they are bad for me, and I really need to let go, but I am frightened to do so. I am so scared about what happens when I'm not holding on to this. But she said, you know, I'm a good Catholic girl, and I've been taught all my life that Jesus is alive, and he's with me, and when I start to fall, he'll catch me just like that trapeze teacher did. So she said, I figured out that night, there comes a time when whatever we're afraid of, we just gotta let go and trust that he will catch us and not let us fall. I, I don't know what any of us may be holding on to today that is not in our best interest. We need to let go but it's frightening. Inward, we, we, we may be terrified at the idea of doing so. I simply know that Easter says there is someone with us who has promised to catch us and hold us and keep us from falling, no matter what we are afraid of. That's the first message of resurrection. Fear not, the angel said. He is not here. He has risen, and he is with you and will be with you, and when you start to fall, he will catch you and hold you up and hold you close. Now, the second resurrection message for us, making his story our story, is that the resurrection provides us with life in the face of death. That's what Jesus said. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all of you unto myself and all of those whom you have loved and lost a while unto myself, life in the face of death. The greatest Easter sermon I ever heard was not in a church, and it was not delivered by an ordained minister. It was delivered by a six-year-old girl. six-year-old girl standing in a cemetery on Monroe Road in Charlotte. I had just done the committal service for her daddy, a man in his late 30s, killed in a tragic automobile accident. He left behind a wife, three children, the youngest of whom was that little six-year-old parents. We had just finished the service in the cemetery. The mom, parents, and some people were chatting with one another. Uh, the grave was here. They were no further away than... Uh, than that music stand. So they, you know, they were right there. They didn't walk away from that little girl. But the six-year-old girl didn't go with them. She stood there, and she was looking at her father's casket silently, just looking. And finally she spoke, uh, not to me. She didn't look at me. She just, I don't know, maybe she spoke to life. She said, 
my daddy's not in there. And I thought that deserved some sort of a response. So I said, all right, where is he? Six-year-old little girl. She turned and looked at me and said, well, he's in here, and he's up there, but he's not in there. And then she turned and walked, took her mother's hand, and began tugging her toward the limousine. And I have no idea what that noise is. What's going on? Is it an Amber Alert? Okay, so somebody's phones are on. Okay, where are we? She took her mother's hand and began pulling her toward the limousine. And I remember thinking, a six-year-old child understands Easter. She understands resurrection better than I preached it back in the sanctuary for the funeral and better than I talked about it here in the cemetery. She understands what it means. I don't know who taught her that. Maybe her mom, uh, maybe her grandma, maybe a Sunday school teacher, a friend. I have no idea, but she understood Easter. There in a place of death, she understood life that we call resurrection. My daddy's not in there. He's in here. She knew that in every memory of her father, all the lessons he taught her, all the laughter they shared, all the love they shared, he is in here. In every memory, he would be alive with her and for her in a way that death could not touch. And even more, she knew her father was alive in a place where there would be no more accidents. Uh, where there would be no illness, where there would be no death, no goodbyes. He's up there. My daddy's not in there. He's in here. He's up there. She understood life, which we call Easter. And that's what today is about. That's what this faith is about. When those women went to the tomb, they suddenly learned two important, overwhelming, vital uh, life-transforming, victorious things. First of all, they learned that in the face of fear, we find triumphant faith. Fear not. He is not here, for he has risen. And in the face of death, we find eternal life. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all others unto myself. Or as Paul put it, O death, where is your victory? O grave, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who has given us the victory through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Easter. Y'all stand, sing with us.
that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father all restored And the church of Christ was born couple of times and I don't know what's going on this week so I'm pretty sure you go online and check you'll find out but uh, <laughs> please let's not forget what the day is all about Amen, um, brother. he's risen for us he's here for us he died for us right now he's alive for us Amen, once saying I always say the more you reach up in his heaven the more he reach down in your hell yeah. so y'all go out there Enjoy your day, KNW, wherever y'all gonna go when you leave here. <laughs> uh, but please, always remember what this day is all about. And not just today, but every day. Y'all have a blessed one. Love y'all. We're going.